that people, I'm sorry to bring him up, but um, it's just a, a way to go into how our, uh, what do we do, okay? When the rain comes down, maybe this will invoke it for us. I've read the news, little oh boy. One day we watched leaves rustle in a playful wind. The next thing, notice strings of aches as dust settles all over our brand new truck. What next? A storm is gathering. The orange-haired man is tweeting his tongue clicks. Fleshy companions swap flies in the swamp. <laughs> A little ball of dirty string starts to unravel. Various black clouds scatter and rumble. Yes! The rats in the eggs suddenly scamper. This is our bad dreams. Quivering in the rear view. Terrifying, really. But I regret it. What to do, what to do with this bad dream? I thought about a full stare down, rising myself up fierce and brilliant in this dream. I ride the black clouds, I put the rats into their hiding place. I see them fade, sadly. He cheats a cold. He crumbles. They all whimper in this dream. I regret it. But you know the way a rain can cleanse the world? The liquid silver sudden sweetness. Arms are open in this dream, standing indiscriminate somehow, but wanting to know it, excruciatingly pure. A waterfall coming from the sky. Silver water coming down. Looking up, delight. The skylight opens up. Water lightly falling. Supplicating, immaterial, open light. Inside, outside, silver, clean, happy, boundless. And from the corner of my eye, a ball of spring goes flying. A black cloud rumbles out to join the weather. Swamp creatures of all types scramble too, orange hair flying. Joyfully free. All of us. In this dream. Yeah. Any Spanish speakers here tonight? Uh, uh, yeah, me too. <laughs> so um, I'm going to read a poem in Spanish, and I hope I don't mutilate it too much because then I will read you the English translation, and you'll see why I like it. Dadme la libertad, corriente juntosa, fuentes del mundo vida que no cesa, con su timidez o su dulzura presa, entra poniente oscuro, tarde rosa, entra, entra. El alma se despierta, quiere la vida con su noche cierta, su manaza terrible y cierta. Entrad, 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 amores, desarcanos, luna, penumbra, días, mesas, años, pavor oscuro y negra soledad. I don't think I can do that. <laughs> Since you all can judge. <laughs> Here is the English. Set me free, rippling stream, phantoms of the world, unceasing life with its darkness or its imprisoned sweetness. Enter dark set night, pink evening. Come in, come in. The soul is waking. It wants life with its certain might, its terrible and certain menace. Come in, come in, come in, loves, disenchantments, moon, half-light, days, months, years, 
dark fear and black solitude. Very short poems. I like the format, you know. If anybody's gone to a poetry peddler, these are Charles McLean specials. And Leo Rivers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the first one is um, driving the U-Haul to get a yurt. Enclosed in this metal box. I thought of shelter, passing by plywood, sheetrock, right angles, square bricks, Invol evolved into high-rises, condos, anonymous apartment blocks, making my mind swim in circles, simple circles, cozy on the earth, intimate enough to see across one soft membrane skin to the other, all there is between me and the wind. I appreciate that because I now live in that yurt that I hauled in that truck. And it's really true, the wind is ever present. <laughs> okay, this one is called Poetry Night. This is about you all. <laughs> Elegant crows and nightingales gather. Sparrows and minas murmur the magic words. Sing the ruby-throated verse. Rabbit ears perk for pearls of language. Subliminal snakes sneaking meaning. Soft pads of phrase stalking hearts. This menagerie of wild, graceful, Gab. Yeah! Yeah, hi everyone. Oh yeah. So uh so I will be back China next week. And I uh, I have been staying here, you know, for four months, you know. Uh, since the and King King, you know, I have a good life in the in the aggravation. And since for the you know, poetry night. I can enjoy the poetry, music, and the stories. And thanks to the poetry group, you know, I can have a lots of friends in here. So I think maybe when I back to China and I will miss here. So tonight I will share you with three poetry. This three uh, of all these three poetry is to explain, you know, the the author is uh, very miss his friends. So this uh, this this three uh, sort of uh, poetry. So the first one, uh, you know, uh, I will speak in Chinese because you know it's it's hard to translate in English. So so the first one, the title is Wu Ti. <coughs> Author is Yi Shang Yin. So Xiang Jian Shi Nan, Bie Yi Nan, Dong Feng Wu Li, Bai Fa Can. 春蚕到此四方尽，蜡菊成灰泪始干。晓尽淡愁云冰改，夜影阴绝月光寒。蓬山此去无多路，青鸟烟情为探看。So this, uh, this poetry is, uh, is, uh, is when people miss his, uh, miss his friends. So this, uh, this poetry is, uh, is, uh, is when people miss his, uh, miss his wife, and he, you know, he, he wrote this poetry. So next one is a uh, famous, uh, famous poet. His name is Li Bai. Maybe somebody knows this. And the title is Qiu Feng Ci. So now it's a Qiu Feng Qing, Qiu Yue Ming, Lu Ye Ju Hai San, Han Ya Qi Fu Jing, Xiang Si Xiang Dian He Yue. Uh, sorry. 相思相见知何日
，此时此夜难为情。入我相思门，知我相思苦。长相思兮长相忆，短相思兮无穷极。早知如此绊人心，何如当初莫相知。So this, uh, this point, this poetry is, uh, you know, Levi the author, uh, author. It's so many things old friend, so he wrote this poetry. So next, the uh, poetry is a uh, the poet is a uh, is a woman. He really meets his husband. So he he wrote this uh, wrote this poetry. Uh, the the title of this poetry is Yi Jian Mei, Li Qingzhao. Li Qingzhao is a, a poet of this poetry. So now it's a. Uh, 红藕香残玉簟秋，清解罗裳，独上兰舟。云中谁寄锦书来？雁自回时，月满西楼。花自飘零水自流，一种相思，两处闲愁。此情无计可消除，才下眉头，却上心头。走在草，三 Q。<笑>那样。I was busy all last weekend with a jar heart festival, and I know how to play jar heart. So I didn't have time to get a new one. I'll read you something I haven't done before, and then there's so many new people. If you regulars don't mind, I'll repeat something. I opened this up. It's called the Poetry of the New England Renaissance. I figured I could find something in there, and this is by Henry David Thoreau. Whose writings is better than his poetry? But this is the last page of a three-page poem, and I just opened the book, and this is what it says: No show of bolts or bars can keep the foe man out, or escape his secret mind, who entered with a doubt that drew the line. No warden at the gate can let the friendly in, but like the sun, or all, he will the castle win and shine along the wall. There's nothing in the world I know that can escape from love. For every depth that goes below, for every height above, it waits as waits the sky until the clouds go by. Yet shines serenely on with an eternal day, alike when they are gone as when they stay. Implacable is love. Foes may be bought or teased from their hostile intent, but he goes unappeased who is on kindness bent. This is one of my favorite poems. It took a long time to learn it because it's, it's an emotional poem. It's written by Paul Lawrence Dunbar, who was our first African poet, who wrote beautiful classic film poetry, but became world renowned for his dialect poems. And this is one of them. So if you imagine for just a few minutes that I'm not um, a white-haired Caucasian woman, and I'm speaking the words of a young black woman, slave woman, in life. This is dialect, so I'm I'm saying it as it was written. So if you if you speak it out loud, this is what comes out. They was talking in the cabin, and they was talking in the hall, but I listened kind of careless, paid no attention to it all. But then on Sunday, too, I noticed they was whispering mighty much, standing all around the roadside when they let us out of church. But I didn't think about it till the middle of the week when my Elias come to see me. And somehow he couldn't see me. But then I see all in a minute what he had come to see me for. They had listed colored soldiers, and my Elias going to war. Oh, I hugged him, and I kissed him, and I begged him not to go. But he told me that his conscience was just calling to him so that he couldn't bear to leave him. Not when he had the chance to fight for the freedom they had given in the glory of the night. So he kissed me. But then he left me when I promised to be true. And they put a knapsack on me and the coat all colored blue. So I get him Pap's old Bible from the bottom of the drawer when they listed colored soldiers. And my lies went to war. But then I thought of all those weary miles that he would have to tramp, and I couldn't be contented when they took him to that camp. 
Well, my heart near broke with grieving. But then I seen him in that street, and I felt like I could go and throw my body at his feet. For his buttons were shining, and his face was shining too. And he looked so strong and mighty in his coat of soldier blue that I hollered, Step up, liars! Till my throat was so and raw. When I listed colored soldiers, and my lives went to war. Old Miss cried when Master left her. Young Miss mourned to Brother Ned. And I didn't know their feelings. It's the very words they said when I told them I was sorry. They had done getting up there all, but they only seemed more crowded at the men who had to call. Both my masters were in gray suits, and I loved the Yankee blue. But I thought that I could sorrow for the losing of them too. But I couldn't. I didn't know the half of what I saw until they listed colored soldiers, and my lines went to war. Master Jack, he come home all sickly. He was broke for life, they said. And they left my poor young master somewhere on the roadside dead. When the women cried and mourned him, I could feel it through and through. For I had a loved up fighting in the way of danger too. But then they told me, they told me they had laid him somewhere way down south to rest. With the flag that he had fought for and laid there. Across his breast. Well, I cried. And I cried. But then I reckoned that's what he'd been called for when they listed colored soldiers. And my life went to work. get this uh, poem of the day from the Poetry Foundation. And the other day this one caught my attention and then I explored this poet a little more and really enjoyed his stuff. So, um, his name is Mark Doty. I really don't know anything about him in particular. But um, I just like his poetry. It reminds me a little bit of Billy Collins. I don't know, I guess there's a school probably of that style of poetry. And um, anyway. This one is called A Display of Mackerel. They lie in parallel rows on ice, head to tail, each a foot of luminosity, barred with black bands which divide the scales, radiant sections like seams of lead in a Tiffany window, iridescent, watery prismatics. Think abalone, the wildly rainbowed mirror of a soap bubble sphere. Think sun on gasoline, splendor and splendor, and not a one in any way distinguished from the other. Nothing about them of individuality. Instead, they're all exact expressions of one soul, each a perfect fulfillment of heaven's template, mackerel essence. As if, after a lifetime arriving at this enameling, the jewelers made uncountable examples, each as intricate in its oily fabulation as the one before. Suppose we could iridesce like these and lose ourselves entirely in the universe of shimmer. Would you want to be yourself only, unduplicatable, doomed to be lost? They prefer, plainly, to be flashing participants, multitudinous, even now, they seem to be bolting forward, heedless of stasis. They don't care they're dead and nearly frozen, just as presumably they didn't care that they were living. All for all for all, the rainbow school and its acres of brilliant classrooms in which no verb is singular, or everyone is. How happy they seem, even on ice, to be together, selfless, which is the price of gleaming. So then there's this other one, it's kind of the opposite argument about aquatic life. It's called Difference. The jellyfish float in the bay shallows like schools of clouds, a dozen identical. Is it right to call them creatures, these elaborate sacks of nothing? All they seem is shape and shifting, 
And though a whole troop of undulant cousins go about their business within a single wave span, everyone does something unlike. This one a balloon, open on both ends, but swollen to its full expanse. This one a breathing heart, this a pulsing flower. This one a rolled condom or a plastic purse swallowing itself like that one a Tiffany shade. This a troubled parasol. This submarine operas all subterfuge and design, disguise. This plot a fabulous tangle of hiding and recognition. Nothing but trope, nothing but something forming itself into figures, then refiguring. Sheer ectoplasm recognizable only as the stuff of metaphor. What can words do but link what we know to what we don't, and so form a shape? Which shrinks or swells, configures or collapses, blooms even as it is described into some unlikely marine chiffon? A gown for Isadora? Nothing but style. What binds one shape to another also sets them apart. But what's lovelier than the shape-shifting transparency of light and as clear, ungulant words? We look at alien grace, unfettered by any determined form, and we say, balloon, flower, heart, condom, opera, lampshade, parasol, ballet. Hear how the mouth, so full of longing for the world, it changes its shape. These have nothing to do with sea life whatsoever. This one's called Brian, age seven. Grateful for their tour of the pharmacy, the first grade class has drawn these pictures. Each self-portrait taped to the window glass, faces wide to the street, round and available with parallel lines for hair. I like this one best. Brian, whose attenuated name fills a quarter of the frame, stretched beside impossible legs descending from the ball of his torso, two long arms springing from that same central sphere. He breathes here on his page. It is a craft that makes this figure come alive. Brian draws just balls and lines in wobbly crayon strokes. Why do some marks seem to thrill with life, possess a portion of the nervous energy in their maker's hand? That big curve of a smile reaches nearly to the rim of his face. He holds a towering ice cream, brown spheres teetering on their cone a soda fountain gift half the length of him, as if it were a flag of his own country held high by the unadorned black line of his arm. Such naked support for so much delight. Artless boy, he's found a system of beauty. He shows us pleasure and what pleasure it resists. The ice cream is delicious. He's frail beside his relentless standard. Golden Retrievals, this is called. Fetch? Balls and sticks capture my attention seconds at a time. Patch? I don't think so. Bunny, tumbling leaf, a squirrel who's, oh joy, actually scared. Sniff the wind. Then I'm off again. Muck, pond, ditch, residue of any thrillingly dead thing. And you, either you're sunk in the past, half our walk, thinking of what you never can bring back, or else you're off in some fog concerning tomorrow? Is that what you call it? My work, to unsnare time's warp, and woof, retrieving my haze-headed friend, you. This shining bark, a Zen master's bronzy gong calls you here entirely now. Bow wow, bow wow, bow wow. <laughs> Mark Doty, DOTY, we're picking up. Right, how's everybody doing? 
I must say, this is my first time ever getting up here and doing anything like this. Congratulations! Thank you. Never been to a poetry reading before either. So I'm sitting here thinking, well, I gotta go someplace for my birthday. Yeah! Come to Action Fiddle. Go to a poetry reading, you gotta have some poetry. Yeah! So then I started thinking, well, what do I write about? Do I write about the mountains? Do I write about the garden that I like to passion about? And then it came pretty clear to me, I'll write something about my wonderful wife. Hey. So, the presents, I, it's like, well, what present could I get for my birthday? Well, she's already given me all the presents in the world. She gave me five beautiful kids. Yeah. A uh, home that I come home to every day where I get a smile and a hug. Uh, din dinner, it's clothes washed, all the wonderful things in the world. I have all the presents in the world I could ever ask for. So my present to her, Sitting back there, my beautiful wife Heather, is a short poem. I'm not many. I'm not a man of many words, but I am a man of short, of few words, but passionate words. And so I was thinking, well, I had less than I don't know, 24 hours to put a poem together. But it's pretty easy to put a poem together when it just comes from the heart, right? Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, with that being said, the title of my poem, of course, is "My Amazing Wife." I would normally have it memorized, but like I said, I had less than 24 hours put together because I didn't even know there was a poetry night. Tattoo it on your arm. Oh, I don't know about a tattoo on my arm. Maybe my back. There you go. <laughs> How can you read that? How? Uh, it's his Bible reading. <laughs> so, with that, like I said, it's not long, but it is, it is passionate and it is, it is emotional. So. My wife, she is so amazing, and she always finds times for praising she is by far my biggest fan. Not the one to cool me off in this 99 degree weather. But, and when she went to Mexico this year, oh my, did she get a great tan. She is so beautiful. And I love how she is extremely joyful. She has the world's brightest smile. And now she can run far more than a mile. She's always so positive. And when she's not in nature, she feels captive. She loves to be surrounded by trees. And as the wind blows through the forest, boy, does she love listening to the breeze. She absolutely loves to live off the grid. No electricity, no running water, none of that. And of all the women in the world, she is the most splendid. There isn't a day that doesn't go by that she isn't dreaming, dreaming. Dreaming. It's nice to dream. And her big, beautiful eyes are absolutely gleaming. She always finds the positive side to things in life, and she always has the world's toughest job as being a housewife. She's the world's greatest mother, and I'm extremely blessed knowing that I will always be with her forever. Yay! Okay, now, uh, I wrote, I, I had brought two poems that are thematically linked to my heart, and I'm going to do them for you, but I'm going to do two tiny little poems because they link some of the things I've been hearing tonight together, and uh, the first one I wrote at the last Poetry Peddlers. A woman came up to me, and she said, would you please do a poem about tyranny? Is that poem organic? Uh, I would hope so, uh, but it washes off with soap and water. And uh, uh, she asked me to write a poem about tyranny, and so I did. And I kept in mind she wanted to talk about the tyranny of people at the top and their family. But, you know, they always say, write about what you know about, which is your own family and maybe the tyranny there. And then I thought, well, maybe I could link one to the other. And this one's called, In the Echoes of Their Triumph. My mother, my father, both buried for years, the tide of their terror gone to the horizon. The radio, the TV, ugly with the tyranny of a new king. He too thinks his reign of terror will drown our garden of hope for centuries. He too will be buried, a disfigured son left to grieve that he never found the strength to leave. Wow. 
America. And you, I probably mentioned this before, but I started writing poetry and decided that poetry was even a thing, and much less a thing worth doing with your life. When in high school at 16, I discovered a poem called The Jade Flower Palace by Du Fu in a book called The White Pony. So I wanted to read a version, not my favorite version, but a version of The Jade Flower Palace by Du Fu, who came across an ancient palace that sort of garnished to the ruin in the middle of the forest. The stream swirls. The wind moans in the pines. Gray rats scurry over broken tiles. What prince long ago built this palace, standing in ruins behind the cliffs? There are ghost green flyer fires in the black rooms. The shattered pavements are all washed away. 10,000 organ pipes whistle and roar. The storm scatters the red autumn leaves. His dancing girls are all yellow dust. Their painted cheeks have crumbled away. His gold chariots and courtiers are gone. Only a stone horse is left of his glory. I sit on the grass and start a poem, but the pathos overwhelms me. The future slips imperceptibly away. Who can say what the years will bring? Like it's a coincidence, but a kind of Buddhism that I, you might say, I'm most interested in follow is called the Yogacara. A great intrepid adventurer from China uh, went all the way to India to bring a book called the Yogacara Bhumi back to uh, China, so it helped straighten out the house of Buddhism. And a fine prince gave him his summer house to finish the translation in. So this. Summer House is where the translation of the book that I'm most interested in studying was done. And it just so happens that it's the Jade Flower Palace. Okay, uh, this is a, a selection of five little poems, I'm not going to do them all, called The Greyhound Station of Going Astray. And I'm going to start with a selection from the book of Retired Proverbs. A pretty girl should have nice things, should go to parties, should wear nice dresses, and always see a smile. You should open doors for a pretty girl for the chance to flirt a while, for the world is full of monsters and their ways are full of guile. Yeah. That works. And this one, what did you say? I just yell at Alex. Alex, okay. Now, this is the one that I meant to read. A, this is the one in the group that I will read. And it's called Rumors of War. Rumors of War. I cannot recall the first time I heard the words rumors of war. A quote from the diary of a diplomat or something from World War II, something from Caesar's Rome by Cicero or Churchill or something like that. When the news gets worse of the world, of some murder, a nest of vipers like rats in a bag, venomous works fills the news of the world. And like cheaply rhymed verse goads our own hurts into throbbing, into aching in line with the migraine of the world that throbs in our skull just under the bone, like the bubbles boiling in a pan just under the lid. Rumors of war trod the foot, foot and crushed the hand like the lying words of an insincere friend. But the spontaneous recollection of a smile, a girl with whom it's been a while, even though it's mingled with a memory of hurt, a bit of color in the doom recalls to you this truth. A flower, even on a famished weed, a flower in the desert, it is a sacred work, for it is a flower in the desert, a defiance rooted in the dirt. Now, uh, I'm not so fond of those big Marvel movies, but there's some of their TV series that I like a lot, like Jessica Jones and Daredevil, and uh, I like Luke Cage enough. 
But there's one character in all three of them. And she plays a character uh, who will eventually become what you call the night nurse. And uh, I decided to write a book, a uh, poem about her because her eyes were so, are so sad, but her smile is so beautiful that she seems to be perfect for this character. And so this is about the first night nurse. There's five before we get to the one and Jessica Jones and all there. They all sacrifice themselves and they replace one in each other. Like there's many Batmans. But anyway, so this is the night nurse and it's about in the late 1800s at a big hospital where it's called Bedlam. And the doctors are like gods because it's the only place the poor of Whitechapel and the rest of England can go to get medicine. And they're being treated by the, uh, the students as part of their training. So they get actually the cutting edge medicine of the era in this place where their otherwise hopeless lives can be saved, actually saved by these doctors who are arrogant beyond belief. And of course, the nurses, they come to bring relief. So here's a poem about one of those doctors. On my doctorial rounds, mine locked to setting my initial in each column's final row, I pass the morgue, and a deep chill passes through my proud white coat. Annoyed, recalling my own wits, I see the door is open, so close it. At fist that hammers from within, I've linked like a sheep, like a fool wake from sleep, and dislodged from my superior station, I liberate the intern I'd locked within. Yet cut my apology short with a nod. I, much distressed, dismiss him as the goose flesh spreads to all of my limbs and recalls to me this introspection. All the exams and silly girls I've left under my wings at seeing the flock of great men bid me, bid me follow them suddenly seem recalled to me as witnesses of an accusation. And making a mental inventory of the clay forms within that stainless mausoleum waiting for disposal at the crematorium, I see that both the rich and the poor now sleep together behind that door and know that pride was for certain the psychopomp that led many a thoughtless king within. So, sober, the warmth of remembering days and dalliances with renewed affection, I saw the night nurse turn from her gory kindness and then seeing that she had mercy in her eyes for both those a blow had laid down and the man turned beast that had set that blow upon him. I paused to ask her if there was some good thing I could do. I have the stethoscope and the scalpel and the doctoral imperium in this hall of injury and infection. And in tear-blurred vision, I saw wings that opening with the wiping of my eyes were removed as but an illusion. Yet an aura remained about the night nurse, and I resolved it was not my call as court physician to impose before such an angel a rank upon those both so helpless and so human. Thank you. thank you and goodbye to this town because I move uh, to China on Tuesday. You'll come back. I will come back as soon as I'm a world famous author that no one knows <laughs> because I'm going to write books but not tell anybody who wrote them. But every, the whole world is going to read them, I promise. Just don't tell anybody that it's me, okay? I don't want to be famous. Anyway, I, as soon as I write world uh, famous books, I'm going to move back and get a little homestead, so. <laughs> Moving to China to write. Anyway, and teach English. So, um, I have one poem I want to share. It's called, uh, where did it go? <laughs> Don't even know. Let's see. Um, I lost it. Hold on a second. Here it is. Okay, I actually wrote this on April 21st. Um, it's called Belonging. <clears throat> and just so everybody knows, there are some pronouns for the great uh, unknowable divine that some people believe in and some people don't. And um, in this particular poem, they're masculine. 
Um, but I think it's very arbitrary, and I don't want to. I don't want to um, insult anybody's um, perception of that great unknowable, undefinable thing. So, uh, just so you know, that's my little like disclaimer, caveat, whatever. Anyway, okay. Belonging, April twenty first, twenty eighteen. Walking imperfectly through this perfect life, where am I going? It's almost time for me to leave. Caught in the vortex, unending. Everything is the same every day. I must be brave and let go of the pattern unchanging each day, only shifting in intensities of the same old hues and shades. What am I looking for? My soil to take root? Do I need high acidity and more clay or sweet? rich with dead life and easily drains. I look in the mirror, who am I? My, my skin around my eyes cracks and sags, showing her longing to reach back into the earth to rest in peace. Every day I watch as my life flickers and every day a little light fades. I lean far out the window of my room of the Buddhist temple where I stay until I'm ready to be on my way and I take a single long drag on this joint a guy gave me <laughs> because he wants my body to taste this beautiful living corpse made of blood and clay. A sinner, I'm headed to the grave. But every turn I take, another shiny, smiling face. I love this place, but I have to leave. I love them all, but they want too much from me, and I would give it all, I have to leave. So there's some left over for me. So there's some left over for me. And God, they can't see. So they don't know why I live, why I breathe. They don't really know me. Where do I belong? In this place? I'm looking for the rainbow, every, shoe, uh, every hue and shade of the face. Learning to love it all, Al Jamal and Al Jalal, shadow and light, night and day. But I need to leave now, and I must be brave, because I'm searching for where I belong. I'm heading back to my grave. Thank you. Uh, it's, it could use work, but anyway, um, I want to say thank you also to the people in this town uh, who have made this town my home. There's some, there's some people here that know me, so I just want to say thank you. I'm, very much love this town. I've been healed here. I found a home here, and I'm definitely going to return. Um, this is my home. Even though I was born and raised in Michigan, this is my home. So uh, thank you for it. And you are the people who have created this space. You're the OGs of Cottage Grove. <laughs> you created the space for the younger We're generation. So Original, <laughs> gracious people. <laughs> OGP. <laughs> um, yeah, so thank you. Thank you for creating this town. And then also, if you want to, some of you aren't on Facebook, um, 11 o'clock on Sunday here, uh, I'm having a little um, final goodbye hugs, brunch and have coffee and come hang out. So thank you.